Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz cellist and composer Tamika Reed. We talked to her in May 2020 about this new COVID-19 world, her projects, her past, and her future. She has been called a new jazz power source by the New York Times and has become one of the most original, versatile, and curious musicians in Chicago's jazz and improvised music community over the last decade. She has a great story. Enjoy. Talk to me a little bit about what you're doing to kind of fill the creative void during this quarantine time. Well, um, I'm kind of trying to take it back to how it was in school. So I'm just practicing, um, practicing most of the days and then trying to get in some reading and doing ear training exercises. And I'm hoping to get into some composing actually this week. Um, my schedule's gotten a little bit disturbed because, in a good way though, um, because I had my my Chicago Jazz String Summit. Um, I was able to still go ahead with that. So I've been working on that. I did that all last week, so my my practice schedule schedule actually got kind of interrupted. But um, um, yeah, we we did that over the weekend, and that was really successful. I was worried about how that might translate um, online, but you know, all the musicians really came with open hearts and open minds and they they did a wonderful job so I feel I feel like I'm still kind of riding high off of that positive energy um and then uh like for the past two days actually my I, I'm teaching at Mills in the fall and so we had a thesis review so I attended those online um, the past couple of days and um that was, you know, it's it's nice to see, you know, the students, they've worked so hard on their projects and to be able to present something is just, I just feel a little bit, you know, sad for anyone that's graduating right now um, because it's, it's just such an uncertain moment for everybody and it's kind of like, especially if you're in the uh, music major, you know, it's like, I don't know, where, where you know, it's just, I can understand feeling kind of confused or let down about what to do, you know? I've been thinking about, too, you know, not even from that angle, but in general, like, there's so many things that are up in the air. It's like, how do you define ambiguity? You can't. It's it's just unclear, yeah. you know? Yeah, but, so. but the one thing that, that's kind of nice is that everyone is in the same boat, you know? So, I mean, and you're dealing at it at different different maybe levels or or your hand people are handling it in different ways but ultimately everybody is um dealing with this so it's like you can kind of have some sort of solid cert in knowing that okay I'm not alone because we're all kind of dealing um and for me it's I've been saying for years actually it's like you know what this world needs is a global lifestyle change and I'm like wow uh, I guess we we got it I I wasn't thinking of it quite this way but um, I'm just hoping that you know we can rise out of this maybe with a better society or with more thoughtfulness I'm hoping I mean I'm still seeing a lot of things that that I don't know a lot of, what am I trying to say? I don't know, just reading things about people just not having, you know, money over pro- money over people, you know, just reading these things. It's just like, wow, like, it's kind of exposing that more about, you know, the fact that we really need to, I don't know, reevaluate, reassess everything because the systems are not set up to do what they're supposed to do or they're not helping people in a way that they need to be helping, and it's just, it's sad. Um, But yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to just stay positive as best as I can and keep up with family, and, you know, I'm transcribing a bunch of stuff, um, practicing and, you know, taking walks when I can. Well, I guess that's the thing about this. The magnitude of this is so... So, so massive, but I, I guess I want to ask you to kind of depart from that. We'll come back to it. Talk mm-hmm. to me a little bit about how we're, your childhood and how you got involved 
I guess I started I started in public school. I went to a French school. Actually, my mom put me in a French school, a French immersion school when I was in fourth grade. And um, music class was, I always loved music, but music class was also the only class I could speak English in. So I know for me, it was kind of like, I really, really enjoyed that class even more because I was having to learn this this language um, when all the other students spoke fluently. And so I was definitely struggling. I was kind of like an ESOL student, actually. Um, I had to get pulled out all the time so that I could work on my language skills. So it was nice to... Um, have music class, and I think I've always enjoyed co- collaboration and um, being a part of a larger ensemble. Um, so I just loved being an orchestra or just being in some kind of ensemble. Uh, and so it, it's just nice knowing, like, oh, this person makes this note and I make this note and we get this harmony, this get this sound. To me, that was just awesome to be able to create something, to make something, to know how to do something, to make a sound. So... Um, I'm really grateful that the, you know, I went to, I grew up outside of D.C. in Montgomery County, Maryland, and so I'm really grateful that the school not only had this French immersion program, because um, I learned language, but I also got to um, study cello. How did how did you get your career start? You know, the violin is kind of a, a, a niche kind of... The cello, uh, the cello, the cello. The cello. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I meant. It's it, it, it's it's a unique instrument in this world. So, talk to me a little bit about your beginnings and how it kind of gained steam and how things kind of started for you. Yeah, well, I've always been interested in playing other styles of music. I had a mentor actually when I was at University of Maryland who was like, you know, you should try playing in this rock band or you should try playing in whatever. Someone would list a poster or something for. Uh, asking for about a cello player, and I was like, ah, but I have so much, you know, ground I still need to cover on the cello because I kind of, you know, started taking it seriously rather late for going to college. Um, but in my senior year, he was like, come on, you know, he he had some like Rufus Reed um, uh, transcriptions, and he would play flute, and I would play the bass lines, the written bass lines. So I kind of got introduced there. And then um, when I moved, well, I spent the summer in Chicago, and I joined a classical orchestra, but that's where I met Nicole Mitchell, and a really great flute player, and she was like, hey, we should try improvising, and so I started doing some improvising with her, and then she's like, oh, if you move to, if you do move to Chicago, you should play in my band. So I said, okay. So when I moved uh, two years later, so in 2000, I moved to Chicago, and I started playing in her band, and then it's kind of, you know, through her group um, playing at the Velvet Lounge, um, Fred Anderson's Velvet Lounge, so I got to really start to immerse myself into um, just other other groups and just other sounds and just becoming more familiar with, um, I would say, the more avant-garde or free jazz aspect of the music because prior to that, you know, I had just, you know, been listening to, I guess, mostly like standard jazz or like recordings by Miles Davis or John Coltrane. Um, but I was exposed to the ACM and all the composers within that um, organization, you know, as, uh, as well as other, you know, local Chicago musicians. And just it kind of expanded from there. What was the first live jazz show you saw that really made you think, man, this is amazing? Hmm. I can't think of the first jazz so specifically, but I would say that I remember listening on the radio to WNUR, which is Northwestern's radio station, and hearing this recording. They were doing like a fundraiser, and um, they played. I I was like, oh, I I was listening, and I was like, oh, I want to donate, and I loved the, the music they were playing, and it was As If It Were The Seasons by Joseph Jarman. And... I remember hearing that and being like, man, I don't know what this what this is or what type of music this is, but I really like it. And I remember that recording really having an impression on me. And I also remember I was working at the Hot House, um, which was a really, really awesome, I was a door girl there, uh, a really awesome club. And I would just hear so, I mean, I was, there's so many shows. So I can't think of one specifically, but I do remember that recording being really, pivotal in my experience, and then just all the different groups that would come through there. Um, you know, I ate Bold Souls. I had never heard of them. And seeing Naomi Millinder in that group, she's a cello player. Um, 
I remember coming in one day and Mal Waldron was just playing at the piano. <laughs> um, just I, I would say Hot House was a really big experience. Um, I just saw so many shows there that just I remember thinking like, wow, um, I just love the music. I love that environment. I wanted to know more about it. And then through playing in Nikki's groups, um, I got to play at the Hot House eventually, and I got to play, you know, like I said, at the Velvet Lounge, and just now we've just played everywhere now. But um, um, definitely those that experience of working there and just hearing so many different groups. You know, I always like to ask about how healthy jazz is, you know, just in our particular time and space. And I think I've really resoundingly got my answer during this quarantine time because I am just astonished at just even when one musician mentions, like, how many shows have been canceled. So with that in mind, kind of let's go back to about, I don't know, when, when, can't, when shows started getting canceled for you. How did you realize that we were getting ready to kind of go through a massive shutdown and a massive change in the world? Yeah, I guess we were in... It's interesting because I remember it was February 18th, actually, and my sister, I was getting ready to go to Finland. I was I was in Lisbon for a week, and um, my sister called me, and she was going on about this coronavirus, and I was like, I don't know. I didn't know what she was talking about. I hadn't heard anything about it, and... Um, it just it was I remember it was like an hour long conversation, just like, Whoa, um and then my boyfriend called me right after I was like, Oh my gosh, my sister's going on about this virus but I'm not really sure and then I realized, Oh my gosh, I was I was gonna miss my flight because I thought my flight was the following day and and this was like I think I tra- my sister was in California, I was in Lisbon, so it, it was like midnight or something. I was like, Oh my gosh, so I remember having to pack my things and I still I remember just thinking about our conversation and not really Fully being understanding exactly what what all the commotion was about, or why she was so worried about it. But then it just seemed like over that tour. I mean, luckily none of our gigs got canceled. Um, but over that tour, it just was unfolding and folding. Like, oh wow, this is this is a thing. This is getting really serious. And like, you know, um, one of our my bandmates is Italian, and um, you know. Everything was really um, ha- a lot of stuff was happening in Italy, and actually, we we were supposed to go through Milan to go to her place in Tuscany so that we could record our next record. But then we had to, that's the one thing we did have to cancel because you know we couldn't go through Milan, and then that's when we were like, "Whoa, this is really, really getting really serious." And then I remember we were us panicking because we played in Lucerne one weekend, and then we were playing in Bern. Uh, in Switzerland the next weekend, and but she wanted to go home, and we were like, oh my gosh, if you go home, with you can't come back, and then it was like, oh my gosh, it just that's when we started being like really realizing like the severity of the situation, um, and then getting news back from family in the U.S. Um, just you know about what was going on, and and then just really wanting to kind of get back home just to get to be safe or just to find a place to kind of hunker down because didn't really know quite what was happening. Um, and then I remember, like, oh, my gosh, the flight back to the U.S. There was, like, 25 people at the gate. And I was just like, this is really weird. And I think we there was no more than 50 people on that plane. It was so, it was just so weird. Um, and then I remember I just, you know, when I got there, I got to the customs. The guy was like, how are you feeling? I was like, I'm fine. But I was like, oh, yeah, the virus. You know, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's so crazy. And then and then uh, I had I had a gig get canceled that week, and I remember saying to my boyfriend, I was like, man, if this is canceled, I'm coming straight to Chicago. I don't want to be in New York. Um, but I didn't know that it was going to get as intense as it got in New York. Um, and then, yeah, once that got canceled, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, this is this is crazy, like this is really serious, and then you know and just learning everything and everything just keeps getting cancelled and it was just I don't know, it's hard to know how to respond it's just it's just shocking 'cause it's just- it's it's just shocking um but under i understand you know, but it's just kind of like wow. And just trying to figure out what do we do. I know a lot of people have just gravitated to like, okay, I'm going to, you know, go to online streaming and 
people are just streaming themselves practicing and streaming themselves doing a myriad of things. Um, I haven't really done that yet, but um, but except for the festival, you know, that I did produce. But yeah, it's just been kind of I don't know. Um, part of me feels like maybe I'm still like haven't let it totally sink in. I mean, I have. I mean, I know everything's canceled, but it's just it's just a bizarre. I don't know, I was talking to another musician friend about it yesterday. It's just a bizarre feeling. I don't really know how to describe it. It's just, it's sad because um, I really love, the, my favorite part about music making is collaborating with people. So um, another reason why I haven't fully done these online live streams because it's like, I mean, I don't mind playing solo, but it's not, what I love about music is the interaction that you have with the people you're playing with and the audience. Um, so it's just it's just weird. <laughs> it, it's enormous, and there's no real way to put your, your, your head around something like this. I mean, there's times yeah. where there's, there's days that are canceled or events, but, like, when you're talking about something of this magnitude and no real end in sight, that's, that's kind of a bigger deal. And, yeah, I mean, we're all going through our own level of trauma. It's no way of really quantifying it, but... Yeah, and um, it's just, I, I think what, I would just say this, it's, just, it's also really hard because it's like, I feel like there's no national plan, and then every state has their own plan, which in some ways, I guess, makes sense because maybe some states don't have the same numbers, but it's like nothing is coordinated. It just Everything just feels so disorganized, and so then it's like we can't feel any sort of comfort in like, okay, we know where this is going, just like month by month, or and maybe it has to be that way, but it's just... It's just a weird way of existing, you know. Oh, it certainly is. It certainly is. So, you know, over the years, you've had, you know, all of these, you've had a lot of experiences with, you know, playing live and being on stage and all of these great experiences. What are you drawing on right now for strength during this time? I guess I try to just remember what I'm grateful for. And every day, I mean, I try to... I try to journal as much as possible, and when I do journal, I always try to think about what I'm grateful for and what thankful for, even if it's something super basic, like that I just got up this morning, that I have another day to try again. Maybe, you know, because also in this time, there's a lot of pressure. I'm Maybe I'm putting on myself, like, oh, you have all this time, Kanika. You could be writing this, and you should be doing this, and you should be doing that. And it's like, yeah, but it's also it's also a total mind bender what's happening so just to be thankful for like you know I got up and did yoga today it's like okay and I realize that you know, my body's getting older I do travel a lot I practice a lot so the yoga is really good so just being thankful that I got up and did that thankful that I remember to drink enough water you know thankful that I got had a moment to talk to my family and friends or to tell someone I love them like I think those type of things um, just being grateful for the life that I do have, um, and, you know, and, you know, my boyfriend does try to, you know, he, 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 we talked about it earlier on about just the concept of having hope and, um, you know, to still, you know, I'm still going to keep practicing. I still love music and I'm great. I guess, yeah, I'm totally grateful that I play an instrument because I hear a lot of people, you know, you see them scrolling on Facebook maybe and they're like, oh my God, I'm so bored. And I'm like, well, that I'm not. I mean, I feel really grateful that I have an instrument that I can practice. Um, and, you know, so I, I think I try to think about the things that I'm grateful for and that I'm thankful for. And when I'm feeling down, I have to, I try to snap my finger, you know, snap them on mine, like, hey, hold on. Like, you have food, you have shelter, you have water. I mean, for right now, you know, we have these things. And so, you know, or just if I'm really feeling down and it's late at night, it's like, just go to sleep, you know, and tomorrow's a new day and I'm grateful for that there's another day to try again. What, what do you like best about being a musician? Um, again, I like the interactions. I like I like the stories, I guess. I would say that. I love, especially when I'm playing with elder musicians, the stories that they relay, the, relay about their experiences, either with themselves or, or just, you know, with other musicians, um, the other heroes from the past. Um, but I really love the stories that, you know, besides the stories that often happen off the stage. Um and then I just love, 
you know, I feel so blessed. I never thought I would get to travel as much as I have in my adult life. Um, and to think that, wow, this cello that I picked up in the fourth grade is taking me all the way to South Africa, you know, is is pretty awesome. You know, I just, you know, I was just trying to play in a school orchestra. I didn't really think about um, these this possibility, so... Um, yeah, I would say the stories and the interaction with other musicians that I'm playing and, and then, yeah, the ability to see the world has been pretty awesome. So we've kind of skimmed on this, but I just want to ask kind of outright, you know, when we do get back to stage and live music, what do you hope both the musician and the audience realizes about this time away? Any revelations about this absence of live jazz or live music overall? Um. Well, I I joke and say that, like, you know, we'll be as essential workers then because I think people are going to want to get out of their house. And I think, you know, while it's a blessing, I guess, that we have, you know, online streaming things, um, it really doesn't take the place of, of just being around people, or at least not to me. I mean, maybe some people don't mind it, but there's just a different energy that happens when you're in the room where the music is being played and you're experiencing that with a whole bunch of other people. And it's not like you're on a website and you're chatting about what's happening. I mean, that's fine, but it's just another thing to kind of be all together with people experiencing art, anything, you know, any kind of art, you know. Um, So um, I just... You know, I I also hope that this whole live stream thing, you know, doesn't make people not want to go out and pay for music because that was already an issue before um, to see go out and see shows. But um, I I I just think people are going to be hungry for um, just getting out of their house and hearing music. And I don't know, maybe people will be more hungry to hear, be more have even more open ears to just hear what people have been um, meditating on and working on during this quarantine time. So I'm hopeful that I think there will be probably some hesitation um, in the beginning um, with people going to shows, but ultimately I do think that people are going to want music. They're going to need it. They need it now. People need it now, um, and they're going to really need it then because it's going to be a long time um, without it. You know, everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fan base, but you're the one living your life. Who do you think you are? That's kind of an interesting question. Um, I don't know. I think I'm a person that's on a journey, um, and lucky for me, music is is the means by which I'm going on through this journey in life, um, and I am... I've always loved music. I'm not always, I didn't know, I feel so blessed that I picked this cello because it's not like I knew what it sounded like before I picked it up. I'm super, super, super glad that I picked it up because I feel like it fits my personality of, I think about someone that likes to be supportive and I think the cello also has that kind of supportive role. Um, it has an elegance. Um, and I like to think of myself as that way. Um, so... I think I'm just, you know, someone who's trying to push this instrument further in this genre of music, and I really love what I learn about myself as a result of playing in this particular style of music. Um, And I, you know, it helps me to grow, not just musically, but personally as well. Um, It helps me to, you know, definitely um, acknowledge and nurture other aspects of my personality that I don't know I would get a chance to tap into if it wasn't for me. That's a great answer. Hey, that's, that's, that, I saved the hardest one for last. Thank you for taking some time out to talk with me on that during this very strange COVID-19 world we're in. No problem. Thanks for, so much for reaching out. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Chicago, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Tamika for her time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com, and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends.
Neon Jazz.